you all to learn with us today. Um, and thrilled also to introduce our amazing session facilitators, Christy Edwards and Jasmine Rogers, and passing it on to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our session on using data and the science of literacy to improve instruction. Let's start by reviewing our session agenda. So we'll introduce ourselves. We'll ground our work in equity as that is the focus of today's convening. We will share Garfield Elementary's journey from guided reading to structured literacy. We'll discuss how Randall Highlands um, has utilized data to inform their instruction. And then we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions and questions. So first, I'm Jasmine Rogers. I'm a special reading specialist at Garfield Elementary. I have experience as a special education teacher in both the inclusion and resource setting, and I once taught kindergarten. The experiences that I've had in early childhood and delivering specialized instruction have proved valuable as I continue on this structured literacy journey, and I hope that my experience can help you today. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christy Edwards. I'm the principal at Randall Highlands Elementary School. I have experience um, with K-12 special education in all content areas, as well as an instructional coach, mentor teacher, mentor principal, assistant principal, and now principal. So the theme of the 20, spring 2022 Aussie Literacy Convening is reimagining literacy. This is where we are tasked to think about literacy instruction through an equity lens. So if you could please drop your definition of equity as you understand it in the chat. So I'll give you a few minutes to do that. Think about your connection uh, with literacy instruction and equity. Hopefully we'll have some chat participants soon. Thank you. Yes, I see giving every child access to instruction, providing students with what they need. Yes, meeting children where they are. I'll continue to look at these as we move forward. Thank you very much for participating. So here at DCPS, um, where both Principal Edwards and I work, equity means creating an environment, excuse me, an environment in which we, eliminate opportunity gaps, interrupt institutional bias, and remove barriers to academic and social success, particularly for students of color. So what does that mean as far as it relates to literacy? So every single individual who has a hand in educating students must ensure that all students receive quality instruction, as I continue to see this in the chat. Instruction aligned to the principles of the science of reading allows students to, ask, to gain access needed to decipher the alphabetic codes. These explicitly taught skills allow students to decipher words and text as they become more challenging, thus giving children access to education that leads students to be able to navigate the world as they grow older. So let's take a look at this graphic that we have on the screen. This illustration created by Nancy Young highlights the need for a structured literacy approach in our classroom. The National Reading Panel reports that only about 5% of people learn to read with minimal instruction. About 60% of the population requires significant support, while 35% require more intensive support. Furthermore, research by Louisa Motes reveals that 15 to 20% of our populations exhibit symptoms of dyslexia. While we may not all, all of them may not qualify for special education service, most do benefit from a structured literacy approach. So we know that the best and most equitable approach to teaching reading is to implement the proven research-based methods of the structure of structured literacy. So now we'll talk about our journey here at Garfield. We have made a transition from the guided reading approach to a structured literacy approach within our humanities block. This is a school initiative with all stakeholders from pre-K to fifth embracing this journey. I will share a little bit about this journey with you today. So in the past, we utilized strategies and materials that were not researched or evidence-based. We used to focus our data on TRC, which is text reading comprehension, and now um, and aligns with what you'd see with level readers more than we did with Dibbles. As Principal Edwards will share later in the pre presentation, Dibbles, which stands for Dynamic Indicators of Basic Early Literacy Skills, is a measure that is used to recognize empirically validated skills related to general reading outcomes. This is the measure that we currently actively use here at Garfield. 
We also used to use the free queuing system that unfortunately taught our students very weak reading skills. The system focused on pictures and context on the page and not necessarily the words. Our equity work shows us that teaching phonics is important as relying on a system that encourages students to guess is essentially ignoring the learning process. Students must be explicitly taught effective reading strategies. We also use materials that were not found to utilize evidence-based practice or research-based practices. So for those educators who are out there currently utilizing guided reading and are working to make the switch to structured literacy, I would like you to stay encouraged. While research has found that the materials for Fontes and Pinnell classroom three through two does not meet expectations for alignment to the standards, there are some elements of the uh, materials that have provided you with baseline skills. For instance, the phonics spelling and reading word lessons in the FMP program explicitly taught phonics. Now, where it fell short is its alignment to structured literacy in the sequence and the steps. As you work toward implementing best practices around structured literacy in your educational environment, you're not starting from scratch. You do have some skills, and so now it's time to grow them. So out with the old and in with the true. At Garfield, we made the move to provide structured literacy instruction. According to the International Dyslexia Association, structured literacy is the explicit systematic teaching that focuses on phonological awareness, word recognition, phonics, decoding, spelling, and syntax at the sentence and paragraph levels. As an aside, when I was first uh, introduced to structured literacy, I found the vocabulary to be very overwhelming. In a moment, I will provide some user-friendly definitions for the structured literacy vocabulary. One of the reasons we switched to structured literacy is because our data showed that we needed to. What we were doing with guided reading was simply not working. With Garfield's leadership, comparing our data to that of other schools with similar demographics who were using a structured literacy approach, we saw that we were falling short. Structured literacy is a proven method that allows everyone to access the al alphabetic code to be able to read. So why did we do it? Well, research from Yale's University Dyslexia Center estimates that about 20% of people in the United States may have dyslexia. Given that such a large population may have symptoms of dyslexia, it's important that effective reading instruction is delivered to our students because learning how to read is a challenge with children and adults with dyslexia, and it is very important that effective reading instruction is given. Effective reading instruction has been shown to help students with dyslexia overcome reading challenges. Approaches like guided reading or balanced literacy are not effective for students with dyslexia because the number one thing that students with dyslexia need is decoding skills and structured literacy does that. It teaches students how to decode. So if you're new to structured literacy like I was at one point, you might be wondering what some of these words mean and I'm going to do my best today to break it down. Phonology is the study of the sound structure of spoken words. This is an umbrella that includes words and uh, sentences, rhyming, and other elements. Under that umbrella, you have an element called phonemic awareness. Phonemic awareness is the ability to manipulate individual sounds that are called phonemes. And phonemes are the smallest unit of sound. Sound symbol association is when we take the sounds that we hear and apply it to what we see. Syllables. There are six different types of syllables, and they're really important as students begin to decode more complex words. The syllable types are closed, open, consonant LE, are controlled and vowel. If you don't know those syllable types offhand, it's okay. There are many resources that can help you. What is important is that you are making sure that syllables are a part of your instruction as you help students decode unfamiliar words. Morphology. It's the study of the meaning of language. Remember that word phoneme? Well, morpheme, the, the phoneme is the smallest unit of sound, the morpheme is the smallest unit of meaning. This will come into play when you study base words, prefixes, suffixes, and roots. This helps students have a better understanding, again, of the meaning of the words. Syntax is the principles that help us understand the sequence and the function of words in a sentence. This involves our grammar, sentence variation, and language mechanics. Semantics are the meaning, and it's very important that the meaning of words are included from the beginning of your instruction so the students can understand and comprehend language. I hope that the explanation was helpful to you as we continue on this journey together. So let's talk about the principles that guide structured literacy. These principles are systematic, cumulative, diagnostic, and explicit. Let's talk about these words. 
Systematic means that it is organized in a very logical order of language. It starts with the easiest skill and goes to the most complex skill. Cumulative means that it, each step builds on the next one. And explicit means that you are direct in your instruction. As instructors, we must be careful that we don't make assumptions about what our student needs to know. And we are very clear in teaching every step and allowing the data to help inform our instruction. Diagnostic means that our instructors are adapting their instruction based on the data that they're collecting. And teachers must ensure they're teaching students where they are. Later in the presentation, Principal Edwards will talk about her techniques and share what her team at Randall Highlands does as they are di diagnosticians. So in this graphic here, you can see the elements of structured literacy are the outer part of the ring and the principles are the inner part. This entire approach represented here is all encompassing. As our colleagues at the DC Reading Clinic mentioned earlier in their presentation today, teachers' content knowledge and expertise are essential to teach elements of structured literacy according to these principles. So when we have evidence-based elements plus evidence-based teaching principles, we get effective reading instruction. You'll see that little part at the top that mentions multi-sensory. Responding to a recent paper by Stevens on the effects of Horton Gillingham instruction, author Emily Solari and her team wrote, it remains to be seen what large scale rigorous research will determine related to the effects of some of these branded or unbranded OG programs. And it remains to be seen whether multi-sensory structured language phonics approaches add value to the approaches that use explicit systematic structured language phonics instructions without a multi-sensory component. In short, multi-sensory components are very important to our instruction. Later on, we'll show an example of multi-sensory -te techniques at Garfield. In order to make sure that we were transitioning appropriately from guided reading to structured literacy here at Garfield, we engaged in data analysis to determine where in our literacy block we were doing well and where we had room to grow. We then took our master schedule and aligned it with elements that were essential for structured literacy instruction. Then we conducted an audit of our budget over the last three years to see if our spending was in line with our academic priorities. We purchased materials and made investments in human capital to support that change. And now we're in the phase where we are building our systems and structures to support our initiative. Another key component of our continued success here at Garfield is that we have a shared vision. Our principal, academic leadership team, teachers and staff members understand that structured literacy is the foundation for students experiencing reading success. In our building, we are focused on starting the foundation in our early childhood program and building it in each grade. This helps our teachers as we have an understanding of where student, what students have done and we know what needs to come next. This graphic briefly explains the structured literacy approach here at Garfield. You'll see that the elements of structured literacy that are systematic, cumulative, and explicit, multi-sensory, and diagnostic. Shortly, Principal Edwards will sh share how she uses data to be more diagnostic to inform her phonemic awareness instruction at Randall Highlands. Within our LEA, we're responsible for developing comprehensive school plans. These CSPs include strategies and key actions our staff implements throughout the school year to achieve our goals by June. As you can see, our goals are aligned to specific reading outcomes that ensure our teachers can implement structured literacy instruction and provide our students with access to skills that help them grow as readers. And I'm very happy to report that we recently exceeded our benchmark for our Dibbles composite data. Our ERE EOY expectation was 27% and at MOY we're at 29%. So to all of my Garfield teachers who are out there watching now, I'm really proud of you, way to go. Here you can see the implementation of structured literacy as it go, goes beyond the walls of our individual schools. DCPS is organized into clusters or groups of schools. The foci for our cluster include multi-tiered systems of support, which include making sure students are getting the instruction that they need and ensure that we're utilizing our data to promote student progress. Our acceleration academies are the second focus. We are working on our school year acceleration academy, which occurs only before and after school. The various programming allows our students to access robust op instructional opportunities outside of school hours. Our third focus and one of the high leverage and key focus within DCPS is early literacy. This is where we're effectively implementing high quality literacy instruction, making sure that we are consistent with the implementing initiatives that we know are effective like foundations and Hagerty. 
So taking all this into consideration, how do we develop our needs-based small groups and support our students here at Garfield? As Principal Edwards will address shortly, we use data from our informal and formal assessments to inform instruction. We utilize assessments that are used all across our LEA, like our DIPLs, and we use various assessments in-house to help us plan. Our students' needs are also taken into account, including what their social skills are like, any adverse childhood events they may have faced, and even thinking about what time of day a student is best and most open to learning. We're very fortunate to also have additional support from our specialized instruction teachers, the literacy lab, and our high intensity tutoring program. And as a team, we make sure that we are sharing resources. Teachers have access to one another's lesson plans and shared data collection, which helps when we are working towards the common goal of supporting our blossoming leaders. So here in practice is what Garfield Elementary looks like. So you can see that we implement our Kidlet tools um, in the top left corner. Um, this was very helpful during the height of the pandemic when we were masked and we were unable to show students what it looks like when they form certain sounds. You can see where um, there's a young man utilizing shaving cream where he is doing a multi-sensory approach to write the letter A. You can also see at the top right that our principal is heavily involved. He makes sure that if he's telling us to do something that he's already practiced it himself. So right here, you can see him utilizing Hagerty and he's doing it with um, proficiency, doing the appropriate moves, multi-sensory moves. Um, and as you see down below, the uh, students in second grade study morphology. And that's what we talked about earlier with the smallest uh, meaning of, sorry, unit of meaning um, and understanding what words mean as they decode tougher words. So let's turn it over to Principal Edwards as we put it all together and hit our target. Okay, it's my turn already. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, give me a thumbs up if you are ready to talk about data. Just real quick thumbs up. Let me see if you're ready to use this chat box. See hands up. Great, great. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so it's the end of the day. I know we are all ready to um, finalize what we're learning here. So I wanna make sure that we are all in so that we can close out strong. So let's talk about putting it all together. All right, so at Randall Highlands, we cover a lot of things, um, but we wanted this year to make sure that we focus a lot on our data. And the reason we needed to focus a lot on our data was because like all years, this year was a little different because we have our scholars coming back from the pandemic. And so we wanted to see where we were starting off and where we needed to go. We already had in mind that there were gonna be a lot of things we're gonna to need to do this academic school year. And that also we had to have a little grace and mercy on ourselves as we began this process. Cause our baby was coming back and some did, some did not get the support that they needed at home. And we knew that this was not gonna be a quick year turnaround of work, but we did wanna to continue to track the work that we were doing. So we knew where we needed to go with our scholars. So for us, the objective was that we wanted to make sure that we're able to um, make that connection with our students and the plans that we were gonna create for them this academic school year. We wanted to look at one specific um, monitoring that we wanted to use to ensure that we're able to capture it in the moment and on demand support for our scholars and our teachers. We wanted to analyze our data every week um, with our teachers, this happened every day. And then we wanted to put everything all together as we talked about the data that we were capturing from our students and from our teachers and the conversations that we were having. So our objective right now is by the end of this session, participants will be able to discuss why they use data and implement a data tool that will allow them to create your own instructional plans and the supports that you need for your students. But also you all, we have to think about our teachers as well, because we have, the, we have this understanding that because we're educators, we know how to use data and that's not always true. So we need to be a little lenient with ourselves um, and be vulnerable to talk about data in our schools with our teachers and also with our parents once we become um, articulate in this area. So this is my favorite. I don't know who you are. Uh-oh, technical difficulty. I don't know what you want. I started over, that was if my you're fault. looking for a ransom, I can tell you I don't have money, but what I do have are a very particular set of skills. Skills I have acquired over a very long career. Skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. 
listen closely. I want everyone to walk away with a little bit more of what they ha didn't have before and having this skill set of looking at data. We don't have to be perfect. And some of us may walk away understanding this already and just walking with my understanding of how we're using data, but we are gonna walk away with this skill set that may, will make us so dangerous when we walk back into our buildings. That when we're talking and teaching and working with our students and our families, that we're talking numbers that they can understand and we're making plans that are intentional. And you're gonna hear me use that word intentional a lot because I love that word. I think it speaks volumes when you use that word because it means that you're actually looking, delving deeper into what you're doing to and being able to talk authentically about what you're saying and what you're teaching and what you're providing for your schools and your families. So now let's look at, look at this from a, a whole child point of view. So data adds, a concrete, adds concrete information to a teacher's observation and intuition, but it will never replace experience, personal relationships, and cultural understandings. I would be remiss if I didn't say all that we're talking about numbers, we're also talking about children. And when we're talking about children, they're going to come with different perspectives and different spaces in their life. Okay. So even though we're saying that, oh, our student came in today and we're doing this aggressive monitoring and they didn't make these sounds. Well, it could be something that's going on with that child that today was not the day for them to participate. And although today may not be the day for them to participate and you're catching that data, you're catching that personal data. So it's not always going to be numbers that you're going to look at, but you're going to look at the child as well. So just think about that when you're talking about data. Data can be collected in a lot of different ways, but always make sure you're never forgetting that that's a child in front of you. All right, so now let's get into it. Why do you use data? If anyone could, if you could drop in, your, in, this, in the chat box real quick, why do you use data? Everybody may say the same thing. I don't care. I just want to see what you're saying about data. I don't good yes oh god yes all the time oh yes so we know where we are definitely to analyze trends yes and that's a hard thing to do sometimes determine goals planning for instruction that's the key thing is planning for instruction you all are on it thank you thank you thank you thank you for participating review skills i love it to determine where students are, I love it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Objective and not subjective. Oh, fancy. I like it. Analyze growth. I love it. And that's something we need to make sure we're able to do as well as that analyzing that growth because that's important. All right. So in order for data analysis techniques to be implemented with fidelity, the evaluator must see the relevance and why it is used. And that's important. So we can say all these great things about why you know we're collecting data. But at the end of the day, if the person who has to collect the data doesn't see value in it, then really, how well are they going to be collecting that data? That is a question you need to ask yourself. So when you're asking teachers, um, paraprofessionals, instructional coaches to collect this data, there must be an understanding of why it's so important for this data to be collected and how it's being collected is important as well. So what's going on in your spaces? What exactly are you doing in your spaces? Are you having this data dialogue all the time? Is there conversations around data in your buildings or in your spaces all the time? But even still, when you're having those data dialogues, when people aren't comfortable talking about data, how do you make it relevant to, to them? How do you make it okay for someone to say, oh, well, I'm not really sure how to delve deep into data, how to make this a data-driven classroom. I don't know what it is to really analyze my data and, and plan for my students. You gotta make it okay for, be, for people to be comfortable to be in that space. Because even as a leader, if I tell my truth, when I walked into this building, I didn't know what to do. I knew it from a classroom perspective, but I didn't know it from a collective perspective of, okay, how do I move this school? So I had to sit down and be vulnerable enough with my staff and say, listen, I need you, you and you to pull your data. Let's start talking about what we're seeing. Because I think we also under this impression that I'm a leader. So I know everything about this. No, I don't. And I'm okay with saying that because I need to grow just like everyone else needs to grow. So once we got down to the granular aspect of looking at our data and understanding how to have those conversations together, we were able to grow collectively. And that's the important piece, making your space comfortable enough for people to see that. So we definitely have to meet educators where they are. I like that, Parker. Thank you so very much. Uh, we must be able to also build the capacity in the people that we're working with. And that's why I said in your school, making it an all hands on deck approach. Got to understand that your teachers, your instructional aides, I think we forget that our aides, many of our aides in our building have the capacity to do this work. 
And, and the aides that are in my building, we moved them from aides to teachers because we built that capacity in them. I think it's very important that anybody who stands in front of a child, breathes in front of a child, should be able to understand where that child is and support the movement of that child. That is my belief. Everyone has a capacity if you give them the tools that they need to get there. Now, now that we know where do we go, so now it's time to talk a little bit about a little bit more about like where we are now, right? Where we are in our school, where we are in our spaces, and what we know. So for Randall Highlands Elementary School, two uh, pieces that we're going to focus on today is going to be Hegarty and Dibbles. And the reason why we chose those two pieces is because as um, DCPS were looking at early literacy, really, really hard. And one of the things we wanted to talk, we focusing on is Hegarty. We actually have Hegarty in our pre-K classes up until grade two this year. Dibbles we're using because of course that will be our monitoring piece for us to ensure that we're having that um, cohesion between what is being taught and the outcome that we're seeing. All right, so at our school, here's our schedule. And the reason why I'm working this way with you all, because I wanted y'all to see like the totality of where all this data planning, thinking, timing is coming from. So for us, for Hegarty, of course, you know, it's 10 minutes a day. And then Hegarty is not the only tool that we're using for instruction. However, it is a, a very big piece of our day because we know that as we begin to think about the implementation of those of phonemic awareness, we know that we're building off of those tools, off those skills in our small group and our guided reading. Um, in our reteach sessions, but all those things is always happening. We're always finding time for it, for structured literature. Dibbles is administered in three windows um, the course of the academic school year. However, we do have progress monitoring that takes place every four weeks for our students who are in the red and every six weeks for our students who are in the yellow. So now what methods are we using here? What are actually are we using to dive a little deeper into what our students are giving us? So we definitely do our screening at the beginning of the year. And we also have our diagnostic. As I shared previously, our progress monitoring happens every four to six weeks. This data teachers are bringing with them to their ELA meetings and they're sharing the outcome for their students. They also have to target the students who are still in the red and still in the yellow and also look at our students who are in the green. During those conversations, they're taking a deep dive into what students did not get based off the outcome in their doubles assessment. And you'll be able to see a picture of that later on in this presentation. And then aggressive monitoring. Many of you may use this verbiage, aggressive monitoring. Some may you say use the word tracking or trackers in the classroom. You're going to get a chance to see what we're using as well. Just a sample of one of the things that we're using. But I want you to keep in mind that, a, that this tracking sheet can be done in an array of um, methods. All right, so now let's see it in action. So I have two individuals that I wanted you all to see. One is actually my para and one is actually lead teacher. They're actually doing Hegarty in the classroom. It's a really short clip, but I wanted you to see the tracking or the aggressive monitoring that's taking place during instruction. So you're gonna see one that's in small group. This is my instructional aid in the small group, and then you'll see the whole group next. Where's our, that sound? Where does that sound the same? Very good. So Ms. Townsend is going to say two words. Your job is to respond with a thumbs up. If yes, they rhyme, Ms. Townsend, or rhyme. no, they do not yeah, rhyme, Ms. Townsend. Jaden, talk about rhyming, okay? So show me a thumbs up if those two words rhyme, time. and a thumbs down if they do not rhyme, not okay? Rhyme. Here we go. Listen to my words, and then you will repeat and tell me if they rhyme with a thumbs up or thumbs down. Yeah. My words are sub club. Repeat. Sub club. Yeah. Thumbs up yeah. if they rhyme. Thumbs down, they do not rhyme. Good job. Club, club. Those words rhyme? Yeah, because they got the same right. sound at the end. Good job, Because guys. why, Deshaun? Because they have the same sound at the end. They have the same sound at the end. Excellent. Okay, here we go. Next word. Dog, frog. Dog, frog. Thumbs up if they rhyme. Excellent. Thumbs down, they do not rhyme. Jay, Micah. Okay. Um, this is our um, kindergarten. So the focus for this um, particular session is on kindergarten. Yes, they do. Why do they rhyme? Deshaun just told us because what? They have the same sound at the end. Good. So I've got Chase. I've got Iman. Excellent. Here we go. Next word pair. Truck. Bag. Repeat. Truck. Bag. Show me. Thumbs up. 
No, they do not have the same sound. Because they do not have the same sound, at the end I've got Yvonne. Say it off, Yvonne. Layla, very good. All right, next word pair. Door, store. Door, store. Yes, why do they run? Because they have the same ending sound. I've got Vincent, I've got Deshaun, Layla, thank you. All right, let's keep going. Our next. So I know you're probably saying to yourself, I didn't know what they were saying. Kindergarten teachers have a special ear. I didn't know what they were saying, but they knew what they were saying. They have this bionic ear where they know exactly what their scholars are saying to them. But I thought it was important that you also saw the teachers asking them for a thumbs up and thumbs down, because as you know, with COVID, we have the mask covering their faces. So this is another uh, way for them to have visual representation of students of checking for understanding. So it's important that we had them in both, um, both pieces. And the reason why the teachers have those two groups right now is because previous data showed them that specific students needed to be closer with support. So they already had that data in hand to know that today I needed to pull these students together. Okay, so that's why you see two, group, two groups simultaneously for this particular observation. I wanted to make sure that I shared that with you all at this time. So this, as you can see on their desk um, and in hand, they have their data tracking sheets, but I want to make sure that you see the up closer um, on the next page. This is what it looks like. So this is the Hegarty uh, Phonemic Awareness Data Capturing Sheet for this particular program. And I wanted to show this because this was specifically designed for this program. And as you can see, it looks, it targets all the areas that they want to address as they're capturing um, the students' responses during the lesson. And again, this is a 10 minute lesson. So this is a lot of capturing in a short amount of time. Now, here's what I also wanted to share as well. This is what Hegarty uses. In your school, you can create any type of tracker sheet that you wanna use. The biggest piece that you have will be the students' names and whatever target that you're looking for. That is the reason why it's aggressive monitor because this is used for us, is used every single day. And this can be used in whole group and small group. And I think sometimes we feel like aggressive monitor should only be used in a small group setting, but actually you can use it in any setting. You can use it during a review, which is important as well. You can use it during, um, again, during your small group. You can use it at various times, and it, but you have to focus on what data are you trying to catch. Don't just be saying, okay, I want everybody to start using this aggressive monitor sheet. For what? What are you using it for? So make sure you have some specificity around why, they're, why you're creating this tracking sheet and what are you specifically targeting based on the data that you've already observed and you know that you want to develop, the skill that you want to develop. All right, so again, the reason why I showed you that too was because it was specifically designed for this particular program, but also the ease of collection. All the teachers were doing was making a quick mark beside the students' names. As they responded, you saw who got and who didn't. So once they finish this and collect this, the instructional aide and the teacher will get together and it will go over the data that they've collected for that particular period, which will allow them to prepare for the next lesson in itself. And it could be because we want to do double doses at times that later on in the day, those students who didn't get it may be pulled with the teacher to actually do another lesson to develop that skill later on in a day. So when you change the way you're looking at things, of course you, well, hopefully you would change the way, um, change the way things are looking at you as well. So now let's talk about this intellectual prep. This is the big piece. This is the thinking piece of it. This is the time where you're sitting with like your ALT, you're sitting with your grade level teams, and you're really talking about your data. For us, we have data, um, data meetings weekly. And it's a, it was important for us to make sure that we implemented data meetings weekly because things are changing all the time. And your, and your planning can't stay the same because your data is always changing. So what are you see? So the questions that they were asking was, what did you see, right? What did you see when you looked at the data? Um, uh -oh. What are the implications for instruction and what patterns did we see? Someone listed it before that they're looking for the trends. What are they seeing? Do you know what the trends are? How are you noting uh, what you're seeing and what you're doing based off of what the, the data is telling you from what you've, um, from what you've collected? So now let me show you really quickly. Um, now it's time to do the assessment. So I'm not quite sure how many people up here have seen the Dibbles assessment. 
but this is a quick snapshot of the Dibbles assessment, what, this, what the teacher will see. Again, I focus on grade two for this particular presentation. And this is what the students uh, will be would be using or the teacher will be using to capture the students' responses. Of course, if you've ever used in class, you know that it's electronic now, so they will actually get their um, data as soon as they put the information in. So I wanted you all to be able to see this um, in real time. So I was able to download a video for you all to see if you haven't, what, what the Dibbles assessment looks like. I am going to say a word. After I say it, you tell me all the sounds you hear in the word. So if I say the word miss, you would say mm, is. If I say the word low, you would say ul, o. Oh. Let's try one. Tell me the sounds in the word am. Tell me any sounds you hear. Ul, o, a. The sounds in the word am are a, ah, m. Mm. Your turn. Tell me the sounds in the word am. Tell me any sounds you hear. Uh. Ah. Okay, here is your first word. For. Uh. Uh. Here. Uh. Who. So this is what I see when I go into the classrooms and coming from a high school, I never seen this before. So I actually had to take time to make sure that I understood what it meant to assess our students using this Dibbles um, applicant, this Dibbles program. This is a one minute, this only takes one minute for them to complete so that the teachers are trying to capture this really quickly. Once they do this, again, this data is given to them um, once it's synced and it's, it's provided to the teachers either later on that night or the following day, the data is synced so that they can actually pull this data to prepare for any data discussions. But once they pull this data, this is, mm. this is the outcome. So in transparency, this is Randall Highlands, right? This is our grade K. This year, this is where we started, 21-22. You can see our BOY data. We had a lot of our babies who um, came and needed some support. There were 17 of, 17 of them out of 38 students who were um, in one class who were well below the benchmark. We had seven of them who were below the benchmark, three who were at benchmark, and 11 who were um, at, I'm sorry, and 11 who were above benchmark. Now keep in mind, these are our students who were coming from a, they were pre-K. Now they're in K, right? So something was taking place with some of them that they were coming with um, skill sets, the skills that they needed in order to be able to address these specific um, academic questions, right? Or ac this acquisition. So by our MOI though, we have moved. Like I'm proud of the kids. It may be a little growth, but growth is growth and I don't care. I'm happy, okay? Um, so you have our kids move from 17 who were, who were uh, well below to 14 who were well below. We, moved, we went from seven who were um, below benchmarks to six who were below benchmark. We went from three who were at benchmark to nine who were at benchmark. So I'm pretty happy about that. And then 11 who were above benchmark to nine who were um, above benchmark. And so we, had, we did have some regression in that area. But what I can say is that growth, celebrate any wins, short or long wins, celebrate them all. So now here we are, we're now at the end because we already knew where we wanted to go. We knew that our goal was to have 7% of our students by EOY to be on or above grade level. We knew that. So that the far right is where we knew we wanted to go. The far left is where we started with 37%. So we already knew that by the time we did our diagnostic, they did the first assessment, we, had to, we were at 14 students on or above grade level. By the time we took our EOI, we knew that we needed to see some type of movement, and we did. We moved from 37% to 48%, which meant that we had 18 students now who were on or above grade level. So now our focus is we want to make sure that we have 26 students to be on or above grade level. That'll be 7% of our students. And yes, some people may say 70% is small, but think about where our children are coming from, right? We have to keep that in mind again, and we have to be realistic. And as a leader, 
having my teachers come back to a building with our children physically in the building, I had to be real with myself and real with them. And there was no need for me to put any undue pressure on myself to push these teachers. And I don't want to put any undue pressure on my teachers to be stressed from coming back from COVID and all types of things and their own personal issues to be worried about moving kids to 100%. That's not realistic. I'm sorry, but it's not. So as a leader, I made the decision to say, listen, 7% is a good reachable mark for where we are once we really looked at our data. And so we, of course, we begin it with the end in mind. And so that's what we knew, like that would be a good number for us. 70% will be a good manageable number for us and an attainable number for us to reach the goal that we needed to, to, to ensure that not only was it going to be this academic school year that, that we were going to be working with our students, but we already had a summer plan in mind as well. So this data is going to carry us over to be a part of our summer plans as well when we take the last, our EOI assessment. So it wasn't going to be just this year, everybody who's in K, you're responsible for these kids. But this is an ongoing uh, work of the entire school. And whoever touches these students will continue to help them develop. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is that why you are here? It is my hope that this is what you all came for, just a little bit of this love and what we're doing at our school. And I hope that you're able to walk away with a couple of jewels of what we're doing at Randall Highlands and what, what is happening at Garfield Elementary. I know some of these things may be familiar to you all, but the biggest takeaway is that how do you treat your, how are you treating your data? Are you treating it as something that's a part of your school or, does it, or is this something that lives in silo? Again, it is important that everyone has a hands-on approach to looking at their data so that the movement can take place in your school, but also have grace and mercy on yourself and know that this academic school year and probably next year as well, you don't have to make these great gains, but please, by all means, make some type of movement. So I hope that you've enjoyed our presentation this afternoon. Thank you again, Jasmine, for supporting me in this work as well. Thank you so much. And feel free to unmute. We do have some time left in the session. So we invite everyone to unmute there. First, I think we got to do a picture. <laughs> if you're brave, turn on your video camera. I'm going to do a screenshot. We're not together in person, but we can be together in spirit. Yes, that's right. Turn on your screen. Be brave. A big smile. I'll give you a countdown. Don't worry. See how many people we can get on this picture. Okay. Gorgeous. These are gorgeous people in this session. Yes. Wow. yes. Wow. They look gorgeous. All right. And three, <laughs> two, one. Hold that smile. Great. It's done. Good job, everybody. And we will turn the time over for questions. And a huge thank you to Principal Edwards and to Jasmine for their amazing presentation. My head is just full of data and mind boggling and just love so many good tidbits here. So please unmute yourself, be brave, speak up, ask some questions, get the conversation going. You can ask the presenters or your peers here in this circle here today. There's 40 of you all who are very smart here today. So let's take advantage. Nice. I do have a good afternoon, everyone. I have a question. Is it a hard question? Is it a hard question? I can't answer. No, it, no, it's an easy <laughs> question. Um, okay. I think it's directed for uh, Ms. Rogers because she referenced the uh, the information about Fontes and Pinnell. And I know they're considered one of the leading edu uh, educators in, the, in this field. And I wanted to know, uh, is that true? I mean, uh, you, you mentioned that their data was not measuring up to the standards. So it's not necessarily that the, the data from the program is not measuring up to the standards, it's the science behind the instruction. So what the point of my uh, portion of the um, program was to inform, use science to inform what we're doing and use database approach to what we're doing. Um, one of the key encouragements I wanted to offer is that while Fontes and Pinnell has um, been proven, I think goes by the education reports, um, um, report, <laughs> it, um, there were elements within it that are aligned to the science of reading. It's just that they aren't occurring in a systematic and cumulative uh, manner. So there are pieces, there are parts, but the entire program in itself has been shown with science to um, that it's time to move to, to a structured literacy approach. I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Two quick questions. Uh, one, was that form how everybody created? Okay. 
Haggerty? Uh oh, I muted myself again. So was the Haggerty form created in the material? Did you guys create it? And then the second one was um, one of the shifts has been seeing a drop in. Sorry, I'm around after kids, so don't worry about the babies in the back. But was one of the. Um, wait, I just lost it. Are you seeing the results in your TRCs um, and your Word WRF list um, in the practices that you're using? Because we've seen a little drop in that by dropping the guided reading practices. So just wondering if you're seeing the growth um, in those two areas on our Dibbles measures. Gotcha. So the first question, um, the sheet was from, we received it from, from one of our other um, cluster schools. They already had it in, in, the, um, in the program paperwork that they had. So they just shared it with us. But you also can make your own sheet if you have specific targets that you wanted to focus on with it as well. So like if you wanted to do, to do the just the sounds, there is, you could create your own. One of my teachers created their own as well when they focus on a specific sound that they were looking at. And then the second part was the TRC. To be honest with you, we didn't really, we don't really look at it the TRC a lot. We mainly focus on PSL because um, they said they found that to be the portion that has really um, been able to push students' um, understanding of reading and the phonemic awareness. So although it's present, we don't really we, we haven't really been focusing on it to be honest. And we're still using guided reading. And actually, um, guided reading is pushed more in my second grade. Um, and we started to implement Hegarty a little bit more in our second grade classrooms now, but our focus has been on guided reading in our second grade classes. And of course we use the uh, reading inventory as their assessment. Thank you. You're welcome, anytime. Do you mind sharing that sheet or is it a cluster only oh, thing? You send me, um, send me your email, I can send you a copy of it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Oh, I think someone's hand is up. Hi, pr principal. Hi. Princip Hi. Good afternoon. <laughs> I have a quick question. Okay. My concern is always when is the how will I get the data? Um, when in one of your videos, it was it like a small group because mm -hmm. the other kids are on another group while the other two groups were being assessed by the teacher, right? Mm -hmm. During small groups, like they're breaking into their own groups, and then you provide work, and then that's the time I can assess. Mm -hmm. You, All right. You can, can you do it at, at that time? Um, within ten minutes, yes. And yeah. then, yes. And then, if the form is ready, like you know, it's boom, 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 like that. I can. So, yes. small group. Yes. So, and and some people like to use it in a small group because you're it's, it's, you're closer in earshot. Um, yes. You know, the proximity matters to some. So, yeah, you definitely use it in a small group. All right. So, another question. Sorry. Yeah, so that going. form. So that form principle. If you upload it like electronic, because now the speed of turnover, because remember when you get the data, it will drive your instruction the following day or the following day. So mm -hmm. do you transfer it or is it gonna come in like an electronic version so you can see, no. right? No, yes. it's in the so paper. Now, this is paper and pencil. Now paper some can, be, can be fancy, they might can click, click, click real fast. Yes. Not that fancy and I don't, you know. <laughs> so it's better for me to, Right, so we our teachers are like it's quicker for them to do that now. Do they transfer? It? Yes, because they create another data tracker in the system, right? And that can be shared collectively. So when you think about, um, and that's a great question. When you think about transferring the data, it's important because that information will be shared uh -huh. with whoever's working with them in the summer, and also for first grade, they get to see where they were as well. Because if it if we just had it stay on paper and pencil, we don't know what happened to it. Coffee could spill on it. Anything could happen, right? But if we put yes. it in tracker, that can be shared with other people because we want to have that trajectory of seeing how we're helping these students grow. And that's also yeah. a learn, that's also um, a tool that the teacher can use for their practice as well, because you don't want to see regression when these students get to you and you start working on these different skills as well and building on those skills. So that yeah. also is a time for us to be reflect reflective in terms of our teacher practice as well. Yes. Th okay. Thank you, Principal. I also will email, give you my email. So okay. you can also, thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Keep it coming, we're ready. Well, we're ready, let's go, keep it coming. Oh, wait, it's on the bottom. So um, I'll just name that I'm getting a question from a friend who's watching. Um, some investing, if you're not doing guided reading at Garfield, what are you doing? Well, we're implementing um, phonemic awareness uh, instruction. We're doing Orton Gilling and base instruction. And when it comes to reading in our small groups, we're making sure we're using decodable texts that are aligned to the data for where our students are. So for instance, if a student has gotten to a point that they're blending CVC words, um, you know, within the Hagerty program, 
we know that it's time to go ahead and utilize a decodable text that is 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 doing that exactly CBC words and allowing them to make the, con the connection from what they're hearing to what they're seeing. And someone in the chat's asking, how do you share data with all your team members? Um, at Garfield, we put our data on a shared OneDrive so that everyone has access at all times. Um, Principal Edwards, what are you doing over at Randall Highlands to same share thing. data? So we, we have the same thing. Well, we have a track, our ELA, our ELA team has a page on um, SharePoint and our math team has a share page on um, on SharePoint. So we definitely want to make sure that everyone has access to the data because that's also about our professional development as well. And our team members get to look and share with each other around how they can support each other with moving our students. So it's not just a K thing, first grade thing, because first needs to also give input to K because they're going to get those kids. So it's important that we all share the data and support each other with that learning because it should never be in silo at all. Neither should the programs that we're using should be in silo as well. So for example, you share you know, the different decodable books that y'all are reading and other materials that you're using um, because none of these things can be done in silo. Whoever tells you that, show me how that happens, but there are always gonna be a multitude of things that you're gonna need to use because not every child will get that system that you're using all the time. That's my spill on it, sorry. And I think the trackers that you're using in Microsoft Teams and SharePoint OneDrive can easily also be used in the Google Drive space or any other shared collaborative space in the cloud. Yes. You have another question in the chat of how does your school librarian fit into this cycle of sharing data? Oh, awesome. You want to go first, Jasmine? You want me to go? Um, yeah, our, so our librarian actually attends our Humanities League meetings. Um, so she's constantly informed as to what students are doing in their classrooms. And she is actually pretty good about aligning where they are. She um, is also careful about using um, appropriate level text for students, but giving them um, the room to explore whatever they're interested in when it comes to going to their special at library. Um, but she is she's actively a part of our, our lead sessions and sharing data. So I'm, I'm gonna go back to this again, like it's really a shared, um, it's really a whole school perspective that you need to take in it. And I'm surprised no one asked about our SPED teachers because they have to be trained in it as well. Uh, one thing we did notice that although we want our SPED teachers to be experts in everything, they cannot, right? And they need training just like everyone else. So for us, um, we took two of our SPED teachers and they were able to get trained in Hegarty. And our summer plan is to make sure that um, everyone is trained in Hegarty, like the whole school. I don't care if you use it or not, at least you will familiarize yourself with it. And it doesn't cost you anything to learn something new. And how about your teachers who serve English learners? I don't have that at my school. Yeah, we also are, don't have that at our school as well, but I know in previous environments I worked at, our ELL teachers are treated the same as our specialized instruction teachers. So our special education department and ELL teachers were able to um, collaborate kind of almost in the same team, but get the exact same access that um, general education teachers. While I am not at all grateful for the pandemic, one thing that it did provide us was access and um, like more robust use of technology. So we are really utilizing that SharePoint. So at this point, um, if I need anything at all, I can actually go online and find it. So that includes our librarians, our ELL teachers, specialized instruction. If our, our physical education teacher wanted to know what we were doing in the classroom, just go on SharePoint, go ahead and access it. Everybody has access. And I love, I just want to tie that back to a point that you, the two of you made earlier in your presentation of everyone who touches a child, right? Everyone who interacts, the instructional aides, the paraprofessionals, all of any adult who's there with a child can have an impact, a positive impact on their literacy instruction and can benefit from being part of that shared data as well. That's just so powerful. Let me share, Sherry Jones, you wanted to know me addressing a librarian. So for our library in terms of the data, of course, they're exposed to the data, but the biggest piece for our librarians is to find books that our students can use based on those levels. That's the important piece for our librarian is that she supports the reading that we need to have in our building, and she supports the resources that our students and our classroom teachers need, and that includes creating um, book carts for them as well so that students, once we have that data, they can use it for that. So although they may not be well equipped on what the data looks like, they are familiar with it, and then they pull the materials that we need to, uh, to align with the outcome for our students. You're welcome. Last call for any questions. 
This has been such a rich discussion today. Thank you again, presenters. Um, just wonderful. And their information, their email is in the chat. And of course, their materials and recording from the session will be shared later. We encourage you now to take a few moments to go back over to the Whova platform, where we would love to have you um, share more thoughts, start the uh, keep going on those community discussions. These boards will be left up for several months. So you can circle back here, ask your peers more questions, ask the presenter, you know, see what they're doing. This collaborative space is one way we can stay connected in the virtual space. So, um, and you'll get an email with a survey link um, sometime in the next 24 hours. We'd love to get your input because this literacy convening is our first, but it's certainly not our last. And Aussie really wants to know what was awesome and what else you'd love to see in our next convening, which will be even bigger and better, and we hope will be in person. So with that said, we'll close out this session and just give another big round of virtual applause to our amazing, amazing presenters. So thank you again. Thank, thank you so, so much, much for having us. Thank you. Thank you.